Our, so our, yeah. next talk, our next talk is by Tamisha Tan. Uh, it's titled The Diachrony of Preverbal Subject Marking Across Nusa Tengara Timur. Take it away. Cool. Yeah. So um, I'm very excited to uh, be here today to kind of present a research program that I'm st just starting to explore and some of the preliminary findings that I've got from um, you know, looking into some of these questions. So one thing that we know is quite characteristic of the languages of Central and Eastern Indonesia and also of many languages in Central Malayo Polynesian is that these languages have innovated a type of pre-verbal agreement and slash or subject marking either with prophetics or prefixes. So in one, I've given three examples of the marking of uh, transitive agents in languages both in East and West Timor. Now, the diachronic origin of these pre verbal elements has been a really long running puzzle since like the early 1900s, basically. But most scholars have actually approached it from the perspective of Western Malayo Polynesia. All right. And in a special, uh, and with a special focus on the languages of the Celebic and South Sulawesi subgroups. And I've listed a couple of the papers that looked into this in those languages. However, something that hasn't really been looked at in the, uh, or given as much attention is what the central Malayo Polynesian languages, and especially those around Nusa Tenggara Timor, can tell us about these prefixal elements. So what I want to do in this talk is basically argue, present some data, and also suggest that th this data provides key evidence for the intermediate stages involved in the loss of Austronesian focus and realignment as a nominative accusative system in many of these languages, as well as the switch from post-verbal agent and clinics, as in proto malayo polynesian um, to pre-verbal subject agreement. So empirically, this talk is going to try and address the data gap by surveying a range of subject marking systems within the Timoric and Sumba Flora subgroups, and also distill certain patterns from this data with regards to the diachronic development and synchronic distribution of these pre-verbal versus post-verbal subject markers. Theoretically, I'm going to try and uh, give an account of the loss of Austronesian focus as based on mechanisms of case assignment and licensing. And I also want to explore the role of agentive zero verb constructions in facilitating the prosodic rebracketing, or basically the switch of these markers from post verbal to pre verbal. So here's the roadmap for today. The first thing we're going to have to do is explain the Proto Malayo Polynesian system to see how exactly things have changed in Eastern Indonesia. So following Bluss and Ross, it is quite solidly reconstructable that uh, proto malayo polynesian had a set of freestanding nominative pronouns shown in two, and that these pronouns serve to introduce subjects, that is pivots in our generative terminology, topics, and, or, and slash or focus pronouns. And here I mean focus in like the syntactic means, uh, focus fronting in like the information structure sense, um, and proper names in any voice. So this could be undergoer voice, locative voice, um, uh, instrumental voice, yeah. Uh, there's also a set of genitive and clinic pronouns that, in addition to serving as the possessor for things, as we would expect with the name genitive, they also introduce agents in non-active focus clauses, so namely non-pivot agents. So this system, along with conservative verb initial word order like VSO or VOS, is very straightforwardly continued in many Formosan and Philippine languages. And so and I've just given an example from Tagalog, where we see an undergoer focus construction marked with this in infix, uh, a genitive and clinic, if you want to think of it as generative rather than you know, organ of absolutive, um, which is marking the non-pivot agent and the nominative pronoun marking the uh, undergo the, the patient. So what happened to these genitive and clinics? As early as 1911, uh, historical linguists and you know, documentarians in the region actually noticed that um, the pro clinics that we find across all these languages that have them look exactly like the genitive and clinics. They literally just swap sites and have become free verbal instead. So this led Strazenon in 1927 to reconstruct the set in five for what he calls proto ambonic. Now, again, like I said, these not only look like the genitive and clinics, but are obviously continued in the many of the languages found in modern day Timor, as in Uat Metal, uh, with, I, which, for which I've given one agreement paradigm in six. They look almost exactly identical. There are two main sides to uh, um, the actual time depth of when exactly this innovation happened. So site A, which is potentially the more early site that's recently getting a resurgence, is the idea that this innovation happened very early in the history of proto malayo polynesian either right after proto malayo polynesian split off, or in the form of proto nuclear malayo polynesian Other recent proposals include proto southwestern malayo polynesian um, basically very high up in the, in the Shambhau, or in proto syllabic um, because we find this in a lot of languages of Sulawesi. Now, side B is the idea that this has been a multiple parallel independent innovation in many lower level subgroups. 
And the evidence for this lasso account comes from the fact that their functional distribution and their formal features differ quite um, wildly across all of the languages that it is attested in, right? So in some languages, it's only in Arialis forms. In some languages, it's only in imperatives. In some languages, it's only in dependent forms. Um, and also the form of these also look quite different despite the kind of similarity I've given in five and six. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to adopt the Lasser side as a working hypothesis and therefore want to explore the question of how then do we explain what happened in Timor and can any of the existing explanations proposed for other languages like those in Sulawesi, uh, whether or not those can be extended to Timor as well. So the core of this project is the kind of this table in seven, where I've looked at around eight or nine different languages of MTT, not all included here. Um, and I've looked to see what the argument marking functions of the descendants of these proto maleo polynesian genitive enclitics are. So crucially, do they occur pre-verbally, post-verbally as an enclitic or a prefix? And do they mark S, A, or P uh, arguments? So following the classic Dixonian kind of distinction, we have the transitive agent, the transitive patient, as well as two different types of intransitive verbs. Here. And uh, so we have an unergative agentive subject, uh, and an unaccusative patientive subject. And the reason why this national distinction is important is because as you might have already noticed, several languages in the middle seem to have um, some sort of rudimentary split S systems where the marking of uh, unaccusative and unergative subjects occurs on both different sides of the verb. So to also to help trace the development of pre-verbal subject marking, what I've highlighted here are basically the cells where uh, agents uh, or agentive arguments are called. So there are a couple of observations that can be made from this table. The first observation is that in the most conservative languages spoken uh, in West Flores, like Mangara and Komodo, the idea is that an, a system like the Malayo Polynesian where non-pivot arguments, oh, sorry, non-pivot agents were marked by these enclitics, kind of opened up such that these enclitics meant to mark went to marking all agents and subjects, regardless of whether they were really agented or truly transitive. Uh, the next split would be uh, the change from post to pre-verbal. And as this change happened, and as languages be began to differentiate agented from patientive subjects, this resulted in a rudimentary split S system in Helong, Dao, affixes, but not uh, clinics, crucially, and also Wajewa. Uh, but the interesting thing is that in all languages that make this distinction, pre-verbal marking is really specialized only for the agentive subject, not the patientive subject. And then lastly, languages like Edate and Uatmetal and also with the Dao clinics, then went on to develop full nominative accusative alignment, distinguishing all S and A arguments from transitive P arguments. And the last thing to note here is that possessors and transitive patients are never pre-verbal in any of these languages. So I'm going to present two ends of the continuum along which languages have diverged from the proto malayo polynesian system. The most conservative languages that we've already seen are those of Mangara and Komodo, and the most innovative language is Uatmetal. Uh, basically, Mangara and Komodo both retain an enclitic only system of pronominal markers, as shown in 9a and 9b for Mangara and Komodo, respectively. Now, these look a lot like the genitive enclitics, but with some crucial differences that I'm going to point out later, possibly extend from interference with the nominative descending pronouns. However, they've extended in function. They don't mark only non-pivot agents, crucially because the, these languages no longer have a type of Austronesian focus, but instead they, they mark all agent and S arguments, basically, of both types. So in 10A, we have a transitive agent. In 10B, we have an unorgative subject. And in 10C, we have a patientive subject um, for the unaccusative verb fall. So you might notice that there's both an enclitic and an initial subject, and following work by Arthur and Cosmas, uh, the argument here is that the enclitic is the real external argument of the class, and the left peripheral nominal is an obligatorily definite topic that has to be co-indexed with the structural subject um, in, in external argument position. So in an active construction, this is the SOA, but in a passive construction, this would be the promoted P. Um, I want to argue that the canonical right edge position of these enclitics is likely a continuation of what we can reconstruct for proto malayo polynesian as archaic verb initial order. And as remains the case in many Philippine languages, we can distinguish between a left peripheral topic and a right peripheral pivot. Except what has happened in these languages is that we now have a left peripheral topic and a right peripheral subject with innovative reanalysis of pivot to subject. Uh, like I said earlier, these languages have no sign of a focus system, uh, Austronesian style, and instead they all have English-type passives instead, kind of like the D-passive 
in Indonesian, uh, where uh, demotion agents are reintroduced by what looked like PE biotracers. So the corn that was right by me, and then the external argument clinic. It's not really an external argument here, but it's co-indexing the promoter theme. Same for Komodo in 12. So I'm going to very quickly present my idea of how this, this loss of focus happened. Following recent work on the typology of case licensing and crucially non-pivot agent licensing in Austronesian, it's been proposed that there are two strategies, linear adjacency, which I'm not going to talk about, and last resort insertion of a genitive case marker as found in several Philippine and Formosan languages. Now, this last strategy is very likely to be the conservative one, given that the non-pivot agent introducing function of genitive aesthetic is actually reconstructable to put Austronesian. So this is how it works in 14a for typical object or undergrowth focus construction. You have an agent first merge in spec of voice P because the voice is active or external argument introducing. And because of some reason, because of the immobility of the agent, we have the theme being promoted to pivot position and therefore receiving nominative case. Now I haven't shown it, but it goes higher than this, obviously. Because as you know, Connie and many other people have presented earlier today, the agent can't receive, sorry, earlier yesterday, haven't been, uh, can't receive case, uh, Mitchell and Co basically argue for kind of some sort of last resort late insertion of genitive case to rescue this element. Now, I want to argue that this situation basically changed into a typical passive construction where the obliquely marked genitive aesthetics will be analyzed as you know, uh, external argument proper DPs to by phrases in a true passive voice construction, reintroducing a demoted agent argument. And so this basically becomes a nominative accusative passive. And it's not unusual for a monomorphemic pronoun or noun to actually be a PP adjunct, and because Leggett and all uh, provide several examples of this happening in Lithuanian and other languages. So the idea here is that what was a genitive agent and a pivot becomes an oblique agent and a subject. So I then propose that be precisely because there was no overt prepositional element, these enclitics lost their prepositional flavor, becoming simple DPs, and this went hand in hand with becoming reinterpreted as generic agent and clinics and having bleaching the kind of genitive or oblique case meaning. So they were reinterpreted from genitive slash oblique case to nominative case construction. So what we have here is a change from a passive interpretation to an active interpretation. This might seem a bit of a big change, but it, it, there's evidence for this from some Arcasians in the system. Both Mangra and Komodo retain a distinct set of true genitive and clinics that they use only for possessors that look different from the kind of promoted genitive and clinics that became nominative and clinics. In addition, both Mangra and Komodo have elements in this newly nominative and clinic set that look like the proto malayo region nominative pronouns. So instead of having the da that we expect that they retain in the possessive, we get C, which obviously comes from the first half of C da, same in the second singular. So this clearly shows that there's been some sort of interference, analogical or otherwise, between this set and the nominative set, which I argue comes from the fact that they've been realized as nominative and critics. Because this kind of leaves them uh, with the absence of a passive construction, they then re-innovated a new English track passive with the overt oblique marker or preposition by here. Uh, and what happens is that after this uh, kind of switch to active construct uh, to active interpretation, the subject argument then lost this kind of agentive feature restriction, thereby coming to mark all A and S arguments in Mangarai and Komodo. And I'm not going to talk about the switch from BOS or VSO to SBO because there have been many good accounts of that put forward already with regards to the kind of analysis or reanalysis of subjects to topics. So that's what happened in Mangarai and Komodo. Even our most conservative languages have some innovations. What happens in the most innovative languages? So as Tyler kind of presented, a couple of blocks ago, what metal spoken in West Timor is really quite innovative. There's a full set of prefixal subject agreement as seen in B and D here. The, the choice of set depends on you know, lexically idiosyncratic facts of the verb, as well as an independent set of accusative pronouns and canonical SVO word order. So this agreement is obligatory. It's real agreement. It's not a clinic. Uh, it's obligatory on all lexical verbs, including all of those in a serial verb construction. And again, here I've given it uh, co-indexing all different types of uh, arguments. However, again, like Tyler presented, this agreement is crucially absence on TAM markers like the Irealis here, deontic row, and epistemic lock. And I'm going to argue that a diachronic explanation can actually account for this kind of low agreement facts. Uh, yeah, in addition, there's no alternating focus system, but that's the norm for every other language that I'm going to share. So how do we get from languages like proto malayo polynesian Manga, and Komodo to a language like what Meso? I want to propose that the intermediate step in the switch from post to pre-verbal comes from languages with split S systems. So first thing we're going to look at Heilong, 
which is spoken on the very tip of Timor on the west. And crucially, there are two dialects here. The first dialect, Pulau Helong, has a purely suffixing agreement system that only co-indexes intentional intransitive verbs. So it seems to have been specialized for agentive uh, S arguments. Now, this is quite archaic, I think, in preserving the not only post verbal but also agentive requirement of the genitive derived subject marker that we saw earlier in Komodo and Mangrai. So this is kind of before Komodo and Mangrai lost the agentive feature requirement. The other dialect of Heilong, Funai Heilong, also has innovative prefixal agreement on all uh, S and A arguments, like what measure likely due to contact. However, precisely for some arguably unaccusative intransitive verbs like go and fall, for instance, it has retained suffixation for just a set of verbs. So it seems, again, that they've kind of singled out kind of patientive subjects um, to receive this kind of uh, archaic post formal marking. So this seems to be the start of a split S system. In other languages, the split S system, um, other, other archaisms of the split S system are also found in Dao. So Dao has a set of proclitics um, that basically mark S or A arguments. And also when they're enclitic, they can mark P or possessor arguments. However, in addition to this clitics, the system also has a depreciated system of affixation, where there are eight vowel initial verbs that have to take obligatory prefixation that looks different from the proclitics. And these verbs are very old. They go back. They're very good old Proto-Austronesian verbs, basically, with good reconstruction. Now, interestingly, there's a single verb, the verb go, that has a independent set of obligatory suffixes instead. And this is interesting because it doesn't look exactly like the prefixes, it doesn't look exactly like the enclitics. And in historical linguistics, the idea there would be that, okay, this is probably archaic. So I'm going to argue that this is an earlier retention of a post verbal subject marking preserved precisely with a highly frequent unaccusative intransitive mark, mark marking a patient or subject. So that's another example of a split S system, and there's also evidence for this from the word order. Lastly, the last in-between language we'll look at is Rijewa, which is closely related to Dao. Like what Meso and Dao, they are pro they have proclinics for marking uh, agentive arguments. However, it also uses the exact same set of enclitics that they use for, possess uh, for patientive arguments as it does to mark intransitive subjects. So this uh, set of enclitics here is used with verbs like go, crucially different from the other go that is etymologically comes from Nakao, and here with the verb come. So pending future work, this looks at first glance to look a lot like split S systems found as well in Central East Indonesian as with Kambera, which is a related language, Acheni, Silaro, and Moribawa. Um, yeah. So the interim summary here is that the languages surveyed are uniform having lost Austronesian focus, uh, presumably, and I propose that this comes about with a reanalysis and nominative and passives, but also that several languages reflect archaisms with preserved post verbal subject marking either for all S or A arguments, um, only agentive S arguments, or only patientive S arguments. So I'm going to argue that this really kind of hints at the role of serial verb constructions and crucially agentive ones in feeding this reanalysis from enclitic to proclitic. So crucially, I want to argue that these serial verb constructions, when headed by a spectral light verbs, and most crucially of all, the verb lakau, go, um, has a role to play here. So this verb, lakau, has cognates uh, good descendants in every language attested, and in every language attested, it also introduces serial verb constructions very regularly. So I've given here examples where it kind of involves uh, semantics of motion, but there are also serial verb constructions where you use um, the verb go in a serial verb construction, but there's no motion entailed. So it's kind of almost like an inceptive or future meaning. So if we hypothesize a system where serial verb constructions, you have verb, 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 they took an agent and clinic on only the first verb in the series. And this would be expected under a kind of DM style lowering account of criticization, where it kind of displaces to the first hit that is in its domain. This can give us re-bracketing of the enclitic on the first verb to a proclitic on the second verb, fed precisely if Go was becoming increasingly bleached of its motion semantics and becoming more like a functional future of volition auxiliary. Um, I see something in the chat. Right, all right. Um, and this also explains why it would be susceptible to phonological reduction. And subsequent grammaticalization can either turn this into a prefix, like an uat meso, or then appearing on every single verb, or a proclitic, but then becoming coming to precede all verbs as in Rei Now, the question is why go? I think go can explain a lot of things. Firstly, it gives us the split S system. 
go in the traditional lexical sense of like obligates a degree of volitionality or agentivity. As we know in the go get constructions in English, like Kate plans to go write a letter, but I will go be tall over there, sounds weird. And also in Singlish, you can have zero verb constructions with go, but they can only be agentive. So he goes score other people, he go post in the chat group, but you can't say he go fall down the ice will melt. So if go primarily combines with verbs also requiring agentive subjects, at least in its initial usages, this explains why the precise verbs that would have been in second position to receive prophetic marking are those that require agentive S or A arguments as well. In contrast, we don't predict unaccusative verbs to occur as a second verb as, um, in a go SVC, resulting in that kind of archaic retention of this patientive marking in Wejewa and Punai Hero. This might also explain the exceptional status of go in Dao and why that's a single verb that retains suffix or marking. Um, and it's also quite likely beyond go that this rebracketing happened and was fed by other spectral and auxiliary verbs as well. So in Wajewa, it is still a system where enclitics are also hosted by durative um, and perfective as spectral markers, right? So we can think of this as auxiliaries. This would nicely explain the system of low agreement in what metal, where tense and aspect and modal markers don't have agreement because they were the first element of these zero verb constructions that lost their what was previously enclitic agreement and that which have now become prophetic on the second verb. So even when these markers go back to verbs, they don't have agreement because they lost it in these kind of rebracketing contexts. So with that, I will kind of conclude. I didn't have a time to talk about alternative analysis, but I'll leave up this table basically that summarizes the results of the preliminary survey. And um, I've basically shown that uh, the tips phenomenon of of alignment comes by an intermediate stage of undergo or object focus being reanalyzed as a passive construction. The rise of split S systems uh, and can then be accounted for by the role of agentive zero verb constructions. And uh, the switch from clinic to agreement can be accounted for by very typical analyses of grammaticalization of an external argument to something in T. Thank you very much. All right, wonderful. We have about seven minutes for questions. So just speak up or raise your hand. Sandy, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I do, Tamisha. I think this is really interesting. Um, Thank you. Uh, and it's really wonderful to see all this data from the languages of uh, Timor. I, I wanna throw out another possibility and have um, you react to it sort of off the wall about um, the change from enclitics to proclitics. You know, I think about the fact that in the history of the Indo-European languages, the um, I think like the history of romance, there, there was a verb initial stage and then there came to be an SVO stage. And in between those, there was a V2 stage, right? And you can also kind of see that that in the, I believe, although I might be wrong, in the development of the word order of certain uh, Polynesian outlier languages. What if, um, what would you say about the possibility that the change from enclitic to proclitic might have been driven by a kind of intermediate stage where these, uh, these agreement, uh, these dependent agreement forms are reanalyzed as second position clinics. Yes, that is a really um, good analysis. And I think this is the conventional analysis that has been adopted previously as well for the Western Malayo Polynesian languages and how that happened there. So, crucially, the idea that was proposed by Wolf is precisely that these clinics kind of became Bakunago clinics. Um, first, Wakanago clinics occurring after negation auxiliaries like we find in the Filipino languages, and then kind of like V2 clinics essentially becoming like verb adjacent. Um, like in stage two, they are basically um, pro clinics on what is a V2 sequence. So, this does make sense for many of the languages that it's been proposed for. Um, however, there are a couple, I think, of um, issues with theoretically implementing this. And in particular, it's kind of questionable whether there can really be a stage where the clinic has to remain in second position or like there's a structural requirement that the clinic is introduced in second position. So something that is to its left, but is prosodically dependent on something on its right. And I think Embig and Noy actually call these diatrophic clinics. This is also something Pavan calls like a type four clinic. So it's structurally dependent on one side, 
quantitatively dependent on the other. And these are kind of predicted on theoretical grounds to be impossible. And indeed, it doesn't seem to really be attested that you have what is a two-p clinic, but something that always attaches to its right, essentially. So um, it seems like as soon as you um, as soon as you become a proclitic, you have to lose this kind of second position requirement. Um, the other reason why I didn't kind of explore this kind of 2P analysis for the Timoric languages is because unlike in you know, the Filipino languages, there's no kind of evidence of this 2P fronting. So even if you have negation or any type of clausal complement either like if or but or anything like that at the front, um, there's no fronting in any of that. So it looks more like Mangra and Komodo um, or something. Yeah. Uh -huh. Very interesting. So, so yeah, so I, I guess my, 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 my idea is that the zero verb construction analysis is basically exactly the 2P analysis, except uh, getting rid of the, the fact that it has to be 2P with respect to the clause, it's rather 2P always with respect to a verb, essentially. So it's yeah, the same in spirit, yeah. The thing is that then you are stuck in a position where you have to generalize from a complex construction to the simplex constructions. But that's kind of the I other see. side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is true. It is also true that these zero verb constructions were innovative in these languages. Um, and so that is something I'll, I'll definitely have to work on. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Before the next question by Dan Kaufman, I would suggest that you investigate the behavior of Go, notably mm -hmm. extremely strange, and all their mm -hmm. embedding verbs like finish all over yep. the Southeast Sulawesi, which. You yeah, know. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I, I, you, you said Sulawesi. Okay. okay. Southeast but, Sulawesi. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dan, would you like to ask your question? Oh, thanks. <clears throat> thanks for this really excellent talk. It's very exciting that you're working on this. Uh, yeah, just to uh, pick up on what Sandy mentioned, um, that was actually something I argued in my dissertation. Others have mentioned too, that there's this impossibility, as you said, of second position yeah. clitics uh, attaching as proclitics to what follows. But I think that's actually why we never get this kind of proclysis in Philippine languages is because uh, for it to happen, it really has to become a verb adjacent clitic uh, mm -hmm. and the verb noun distinction in Philippine languages is, is somewhat weak. So you yeah. do get proclysis really at the same time that you get a more robust noun verb uh, distinction uh, based yeah. on totally independent factors. And then you find it really throughout Western Malayo Polynesian languages and, yeah. and uh, outside as well. Um, but the, the process had also been described by Starostopoli and Reed, they called it ox mm -hmm. axing. Mm, um, okay. yeah. And you, you find it uh, very clear examples, rare examples, uh, but very clear in uh, languages like Ibaloi in the Northern Philippines and Yami on, on Orchid Island, where you get a proclysis and clysis um, uh, difference. Uh, but when you get proclysis, you really get the meaning of the missing auxiliary that used to host it. So it's oh, like a future that's really cool. in, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my question though is uh, how can we rule out so the the change from focus type system or ergative uh, syntax Ooh. to nominative accusative syntax uh, has also been described as um, being triggered by changes in the transitivity of the actor voice. And I think that's right. definitely one legitimate path. How can we rule out that uh, some of these uh, verbs in the Timor area are not actually inherited from active voice. I see. And, OK, yeah. This is something that I, I, I have been kind of looking into to see if whether there are any archaic remnants of active voice morphology in these languages. It is surprisingly hard to find any evidence of like among <laughs> prefix or even the in or the, uh, sorry, even like the in kind of um kind of stuff, which is quite interesting. I do think in what metal there are some archaic forms. So crucially, if you want to um, create a stative noun, of a, a vowel initial verb. So if you want to add the mer prefix for a vowel initial verb, you have to first attach what looks like uh, what looks like third singular agreement, like looks like a noun, but it's really just an n. And I think that that n that has been fossilized in precisely these constructions for some reason could come from that kind of active voice. So like what it looks like ma plus uh, agreement prefix is really a or either either state of ma or like mung or something like that. So I think that is possible but this really begs for the investigation of what happened to all these prefixes because it's hard to find any any evidence of them sticking around um so yeah that is definitely something i i, I have to look into that's a very good idea thank you mm -hmm. yeah thanks 
All right, thank you, Tamisha. Uh, I think okay. it might be time to move on to our next talk. Um,